What's up? You're listening to The Long Game, and I'm your host, David Lee Kim, co-founder of Omniscient Digital. In this episode, we chat with Morty Oberstein. Morty is the head of SEO brand at Wix and the author of the Wix SEO Guide. He also serves as a communication advisor for SEM Rush. Dedicated to SEO and education, Morty is the host of the Serps Up podcast and co-host of the Edge of Web's news podcast. In this conversation, we talk about his role at Wix leading SEO brand and how Wix's platform and reception has evolved tremendously in the SEO community. We get really deep into conversation about AI and SEO and not just the superficial stuff, like using AI to write content, but what it means for the internet, for businesses, and of course, for SEO professionals. I think you're gonna learn a lot. Here's my conversation with Morty Oberstein. Morty, welcome to The Long Game. Hey, thanks for having me. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you doing, man? I'm good. I, I, I'm in that point of the season where you, you get the sniffles and you can't get rid of them. Yeah. Just earlier today, I took my dog out and it, it just snowed in Boston and I started kind of sniffling and coughing a little bit. I was like, oh no, either like I'm just getting a little scratch or this might turn into something in a couple hours. Right. It's that little scratch. I knew it was coming about a week and a half ago. I, I know, I know that scratch. And the question is only how bad, not too bad. Yes. So thank God, like, it's not too bad, but you knew it was coming. I knew it was coming. Well, hey, it's great to finally have you on a podcast. In my research, I've gotten to hear a lot about kind of what's been top of mind for you. And I, I feel like a couple of those things might be recurring themes in our conversation today. So to set the table a little bit for folks listening, one of the common things that I think we'll, we'll talk about here is people talk about AI and SEO in the same breath, but there are really multiple things happening. I have three listed here. Maybe there's more, but there's one, using AI to produce content to Google's search generative experience or SGE. And then the third is more around like searcher behavior, consumer behavior around changing from search engines to chat GPT, other LLMs or how they might peruse the, the search results. Um, is there anything that you would add there? Well, I always would throw in like the caveat that Google has been using, we call it AI, but it's really machine learning for years in their algorithm. So it, the idea of AI being new to Google is, to quote Barry Schwartz, the famous SEO, not new. It's new on the generative side, but not in the algorithmic side. This has been going on since 2015. Yeah, and maybe before we dig deep into that, I want to give folks a little bit of background. So you're currently uh, leading up the SEO branding efforts at Wix. Just a little bit of my history with Wix. I remember trying to use it years ago, and let's just say I didn't have a great experience. Um, my I think I think the common impression over at that time was that it was it was a website built for like mom and pop businesses or something. It wasn't well optimized for search engines. And then I I recently my girlfriend is is in business school. She's been building like her own personal website and stuff for her for classes. She's using Wix, and I was watching her build. It. I was like, "What builder is that? Like, what are you using?" And I was like, "Oh my god, that's Wix." That's yep. this is not the same thing. So I, I don't know what you're doing there. Maybe you can share a little bit about what, what you're doing as in your role at Wix, but it's it's amazing seeing how it's evolved. I'll tell you like, uh, the, the inside scoop on this. So first off, if you dig through my Twitter somehow, somewhere, there was a tweet I put out, because uh, you know, Wix put out a, uh, a Super Bowl ad. I think it was like 2018. It's the year the Seahawks won the Super Bowl. I always screw up the years. And they put out an ad with um, a model, Carly Kloss, something like that. And in the in the ad, it's a thirty second Super Bowl ad. They pay a million of dollars for it, and they say, "Yeah, we have you know the best SEO or something like." Or SEO is a cinch with Wix, and SEOs, including myself, lost their collective minds. Like, oh, you don't need us. So out there somewhere is me crapping on Wix in a tweet from way back. I look for it myself, but I can't find it. But I know that it's there somewhere. It doesn't exist, but you know in your heart. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> The, the story was that I was working for an SEO tool called Rank Ranger, which got bought out by SimilarWeb two years ago, I think in terrible time. And I was the CMO of the company. We had a client who was the head, CEO of an, uh, a big SEO agency. We were pretty tight. And he went over to Wix and he headed up their SEO product development. But one thing led to another thing and they realized like, hey, we fixed a lot of the things about the product, but the SEO world has absolutely no, no clue. 
And we'd also like to hear what they want us to do, and we don't know. So my friend, who is now the head of SEO at Wix, said, hey, why don't you come on board and act like a liaison for us to the SEO community? And that's how I got started with this whole thing. At this point, so first off, we fixed a freaking ton. The whole platform in general has completely evolved. There's now another platform called Wix Studio, which is an Uber design platform for, for agencies. There's cool stuff like, you know, you can hand off um, the sites to clients with the whole uh, handoff kit, and there's reporting, and there's collaboration tools, and all this is great stuff for designers that I know nothing about because I am an SEO and not a designer. So it's come a, a really long way. My role now is about positioning the platform and the company around SEO and digital marketing. How do we want to talk about SEO? What do we want to say about SEO? What do we want to say about digital marketing? Uh, what kind of educational assets do we want to do? What's important for us in talking to our own users, current users, future users about SEO? So all things tone, branding, messaging, and education around SEO is my team, or our team. What made you believe that that was where you wanted to, to build your SEO career? That, the guy. Okay. I would not have taken the job at Wix if Wix just kind of came to me back then and said, now I would, because the reputation has turned on its head. I think everyone was like, oh yeah, Wix, that'd be great to get a job there. Back in the day, before all this happened, I would not probably not have taken the job. I only took the job because I knew the person behind the, the product fixes and I trusted him. And I, if, if he went there, and he said he's working on it and they're going to do things that are great, I trust him. That was literally it. Yeah, now you have like this huge SEO learning hub. You have the Surf's Up podcast. We have webinars and newsletters. We have a resource center. We're doing, we have, um, we stole the editor from Search Engine Land, George Wind, to manage the editorial for the hub. We have Crystal Carter, who's a fabulous SEO mind and influencer working on the team. It's, it's really cool stuff. Yeah, and I'll stop tooting your horn after this, but I, I was talking to my girlfriend and she, she knows what I do at some, at this point. She's asked a lot of questions not, and I've had to explain SEO to her. And she was speaking to me about SEO. And I was like, how'd you learn all of this? She said, oh, the Wix blog is great. And like the Learning Hub is great. So nice. she asked me to pass that on to you because I told her that I was going to be speaking to you. <laughs> I, I love that. The best moment I really ever had in terms of like education and, and Wix was I got a LinkedIn message from somebody, a, a Wix user, I have a website, I, you know, I sell nutritional, whatever, whatever. And I noticed her profile and said Baltimore. I thought I recognized the name. And it turns out it was a neighbor of my wife's growing up. <laughs> and she said, yeah, I was listening to your podcast about this and this and that about SEO. And I had a question like, guys, oh, come full circle. I've reached the pinnacle. The average, you know. I love that. Wix, we have people who are big SEOs who are listening to the podcast. But it's super cool that someone who had no idea about SEO beforehand is now interested in SEO because what we're doing is super rewarding. I am done true to my own horn now. Let's talk about AI. That that warms my heart, uh, truly. So yeah, let's let's talk about AI. And I know this is something you've talked about on multiple podcasts, including the Surf's Up podcast, which we'll link to. But one of the, the big things is like the impact of AI on SEO. And I love that what you've done on some of these other interviews you've done is you go beyond the superficial. You're not just talking about AI for content creation or optimizing title tags. In fact, you kind of like make fun of that. Uh, you get uh, kind of into some of the philosophical around like what the hell does it mean for the internet? But maybe before we lose like 80% of <laughs> listeners, let's talk about what it means for like marketers and marketing teams. You had shared in your notes before we chatted that AI has kind of forced a, a new content conversation where we need to sort this out, where the fallout of AI content is going to add some tensions maybe between different types of marketers, brand marketing kind of came up. Would love to hear you share more about that. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not anti-AI. I'm just very, very skeptical about what AI can do. Um, you know, look, if it's writing a title tag, if it's writing a meta description, I, fine. You know, as long as you're checking it, like, you know, those things aren't going to make or break you anyway. But, like, you know, even John Mueller from Google said at one point way back, even before the whole AI conversation, you know, I imagine tools will be able to write headers for you and title tags for you. It's, it's pretty closed kind of uh, task. I, I think what it does, though, is you're right, it, it opens up a whole conversation. I think to me, like the biggest thing AI has done, and I know it's like a hot take, is create a conversation about what is good content and what kind of content should we be creating? And it does kind of, in my mind, you know, you have like elections sometimes, I don't want to get political here at all, and, and the country swings one way, and then all of a sudden it swings a completely opposite way in the next election. Like we can't find a happy medium somewhere. It's kind of the same thing with AI. Like, oh, AI, everything AI. It doesn't matter. 
AI can watch my children. AI can make a soup. AI can do everything. <laughs> we'll use it for absolutely everything. And then there's you know, a, a pushback to that. And I think in this case, a healthy pushback. Okay, but maybe I really don't want AI in this case. Maybe I actually want, I'm, I'm searching for something out of very, I was searching right before this. I have like a silicone uh, dish and it got ruined in the dishwasher. It smells like soap. And I was trying to figure out how do I clean this thing. I, I just wanted a real person to tell me like they had the same problem. Here's how I did it. So I think there's a, a natural pushback to that. And that does mean that the content what users are expecting is shifting. And in regards to AI, I think it means that I might be okay for with something uh, AI about you know changing a tire, really generic stuff. Fine, I don't what do I care? Just tell me how to change a tire. It's really simple, it's really straightforward, it's not a big deal, it's very top level. But once we're getting to the things I actually really care about, they're a little bit nuanced or whatever it is, I, as a user, may not want AI and I may want to know, because I know everyone's using AI, that this is not AI. And that this is actually, there's some kind of human who touched this at some point. And that kind of drives content to be a little bit more real and a little bit more conversational and a little bit more experience-based, sort of show that there's a human element to this. That, that whole idea of any experience, a human touch, a human tone, all that kind of like pushback to the AI conversation is not great for SEOs in a certain context because SEOs like things to be very linear. Why, why not? There's an H2. Okay, that H2 will target this query, how to clean the dish with baking soda. Next H2, how to clean the dish after I messed up the baking soda because that keyword has a search on me 500. You forgot the first H2. What, what is washing dishes? <laughs> I'm sorry. I am such a horrible SEO. Right. What is washing dishes? What are dishes? What is washing dishes? <laughs> <laughs> and if the content becomes more conversational, then those kind of headers don't work. And SEOs are going to have to adapt. How do I be more conversational while still optimizing the page? And SEOs who still look at content very linearly, which some SEOs do, some SEOs don't. I'm not trying to put anybody into a box. But SEOs that do are going to have a problem with brand marketers who are thinking, you know what, I really need to show that this piece is conversational, this piece strikes the right tone with the audience, it's differentiated, it's human. SEOs are going to come into the room and say, no, 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 we need to target keywords, we need to be very um, explicit and very clear and very to the point, and they're going to butt heads. And my experience in organizations are brand markers are way up here, like next to the CMO kind of thing. And SEOs are way down there. And that's not a fight if you're in a big organization that you really want to pick. Is it mutually exclusive, though, between those two? No, that's the best part. It's not. I will say there are cases where Google has gaps and you need to be overly explicit. If you search for best SEO podcast, you will see a podcast that ranks because it used the word best like all over the place. That's a gap. That's a gap in the algorithm. Um, there are many gaps in the algorithm. And if your job as an SEO is to know that, in this case, Google seems to be very conversational. They understand the content there. It's very semantic. We're okay. In this case, there's a gap here. Google doesn't really get it. Google's very confused. It's having a hard time with the topic. And there's many ways you could see that. Volatility of the rankings themselves will tell you that. If you see that rank for all of the results is bouncing all over the place, that's a good indicator Google's very confused about this keyword. So maybe you want to be more explicit. And then have that conversation with the brand marketing to make, yeah, I get what you're doing. However, just know the facts here in this particular case, Google is, is a little bit more confused. We need to be a little bit more explicit. But as a rule, Google has used things like machine learning or AI to figure out context, to better understand language, and to better understand user behavior. So you don't necessarily need to feel in conflict. And there are many ways to skin a cat, by the way. You can rank a piece of content and, and not be 100% explicit in every single header and put the keyword in every single header either. So there's that. It's interesting, maybe going back to some of your initial points, it's there's sort of this boomerang that happened where when AI and like generative AI came out, all these tools came out, almost every client we had, almost every sales call we had, they were like, we want hundreds or thousands of pages with AI content. And we had to fight tooth and nail to be like, that is a horrible idea. <laughs> like, here are the reasons why. Like, we get it. It'll be cheap content. Like, you don't even need to work with us if you want to do that. But it's 
going to have a lot of negative ramifications for your website. But how did that go? Do they take that as like, oh, okay, or they no, 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 AI? It was many conversations that had to walk them back from that. And I think oh, we, we were fortunately able to do it for most of them. But now what we're hearing from people is we need to produce content that ChatGPT can't write. So it's just this weird boomerang where they realize, it's amazing. oh yeah, that was that was probably a bad idea. And maybe they saw some of the case studies like that SEO heist one. I, I'm sure you saw that where... Yeah, that's a great one. There's a whole bunch of these. Yeah, not always, not always. I think there's a time and place, but... A- a- AI content can rank. LinkedIn articles that they create through AI, those rank. You're also not LinkedIn, by the way. Like most of them are not LinkedIn. You don't have all that brand, you know, uh, cachet to, to rank for AI content like that. So I'm not saying you can't use AI content or create AI content, but it's something you have to think about. Even if you, even if you could rank it, let's say you ranked it, and then the user came to the page, but, oh, AI content again? What, what good was that? Yeah. The way I've been communicating with some folks is, hey, in the old world of SEO, and this is the way people typically do it, is they bifurcate. There's cheap SEO content, and then there's thought leadership content. And we're like, that's not this world anymore. Like, it's all content. Every piece of art content you put out needs to reflect your thought leadership, brand point of view, subject matter expertise. It's not just, quote, cheap SEO content anymore. And some have bought in, some have said, we're going to go with a cheaper alternative. We just want someone writing like SEO content. And we're like, good luck. Good, good luck getting indexed, by the way. I think that's the next battle. Like That's the next SEO battle is that Google's getting much, I've seen it, other SEOs have I've seen it. Google's getting much uh, stricter or much more um, uptight about indexing. So in order to become indexed, because first off, you have to realize that indexing is very expensive. Crawling and indexing are very, very expensive. So Google does not want to store all your crap in its index because it costs money. So if it can figure out better ways to decipher what's good and what's crap, it will. And it's basically, you know, super niche content or content that's not really, it's not really very well targeted. It's not really, really, you know, very well constructed. What's the purpose of this? What are you really trying to say here? It doesn't get indexed the way that it used to. And that's the next front where people are going to realize, okay, we have to do the AI thing, but you're not even indexed. Forget ranking. Okay, so let's let's say maybe with our semi rants uh, that folks kind of are bought in to to what we're saying right now. How should SEOs be adapting? I think you do want to use AI to streamline things that are um, I won't call them a waste of your time. Like to me, like writing meta descriptions. I I don't see them. I, I know SEOs go back and forth. Like, are they really a ranking factor? Are they not a ranking factor? Google said they're not, but Google also said they use it to understand the page secondary. Blah blah blah. Whatever. If you're thinking that the, the meta description either way is going to move the needle, it's not really a move the needle. Go ahead. Use, use AI focus on other things. Fine. In terms of the content itself, I think SEOs need to adapt by understanding content fundamentally and understanding the types of content fundamentally, like understanding that a meta description or a product description, like how many ways are you can describe a pair of socks? Like, fine. Go ahead. Have the AI write about what this pair of socks are and how great the elastic in the socks are. Wonderful. But you have to be able to distinguish between that and actual content, and what it means to write content, and what users are looking for out of content right now. And it's funny, because SEOs always chase the algorithm. Oh, what's the algorithm doing? What's the algorithm doing? And it, that never made sense to me, because more stuff, I'm not saying you shouldn't look at what the algorithm is doing, because reverse engineering, what you're seeing happen in terms of what's ranking, what's not ranking, can indicate to you what Google is and what Google is not able to do. That is important. But in terms of creating content fundamentally, the algorithm is chasing the user. So you're chasing the thing, chasing the thing. That doesn't make any sense. At some point, I think it comes down, SEOs don't believe Google will ever get it. Some SEOs. Google will never be able to do this. They're always going to look at things like links. They're always going to look at things like user behavior. They're never going to be able to understand content to the point that I really need to understand content the way that I should understand content. I think that's crazy. I'm not as well spoken about as you saw. I'll hand it over to you. But I remember reading a couple of articles where you were saying, hey, people don't believe Google is going to catch up. But Google released like the Google Mum update, was it called? Where it's like, they are getting better at this, right? Google has this thing. I think Mum is amazing. It's not really fully integrated into the algorithm. It is part, by the way, of SGE. They said that they do use Mum and SGE. What, okay, what Mum, Mum is a multitask unified model. Um, it sounds really complicated. One of the two, it does two fundamental things, you know, sitting on one foot. One is it takes, usually you, you, you give an input to the machine learning and it gives you back an output, right? I feed it text, I get back text. I feed it image information, I get back image information. 
Multimodal means it combines multiple channels of media. So for example, uh, you can now, for the past couple of years, take a picture of something with Google Lens that maybe you don't know what it is. Like I think you know the, the example Google gave back when was something like, uh, it took a picture of like a bicycle chain or a bicycle gear and said, how to fix. I Meaning, I don't know what this gizmo is called, but I know I need to fix it. So Google, oh, we've identified through the picture that this is a bicycle chain and you asked how to fix. So we paired the image, we paired the text, and now we're gonna give you search results. So it's unifying multiple channels of information to give you what you want, super cool. The other thing is that it's a it, it's able to parse and understand contextual content on steroids compared to the other current machine learning properties like BERT. What I mean by that is the example Google gave way back when was, I just finished climbing, uh, I don't know, Mount, you know, Mount Washington, now I want to climb Mount Adams. What do I need to do to prepare differently? And one of the things Google showed was that it's able to parse the word prepare. Does prepare mean to go hiking? Uh, does prepare mean to uh, uh, get the equipment? Does prepare mean to do training? Does prepare mean to read up on techniques? What does it mean? To, here's all of the different ways that the word prepare could possibly fit into this context. That's not fully released into the algorithm yet, but at some point, those kind of things are going to be fully implemented. Google didn't invest probably billions of dollars into this stuff not to use it. It did use it, by the way, with COVID. It found that there was multiple, like uh, not multiple, a crazy number of names for the vaccines. And it had a hard time figuring out in a certain country when they called it, you know, X vaccine, it was that the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, is that the, the Pfizer vaccine? And it used mum to figure out all of the names. Oh, that is really the, the, the Pfizer one. And that name is really the Johnson & Johnson one. And it used mum to parse all of that out. So it has used it to select instances. But those kind of things, that ability to parse out content like that is a huge leap for Google. And they're not going to just stay static where they are. They are eventually going to continuously improve. And if you look what they've done over the last, I don't know, five, six, seven, eight years, they have, even with the bad press. And this this is, it's, you're taking me a lot of different directions, but where my mind goes is going back to the, you know, you said something really interesting around SEOs are solving for the algorithm, not the user, but the algorithm solving for the user. And an observation I've had is when I myself do Google's, Google search, first top 10 search results say almost the same thing. None of it's valuable. And I'll do like, I'll append Reddit to the end, which I think was a trend people were talking about for a little bit, because I want to hear a human tell me, not someone writing for an algorithm. I, I mean, it's kind of more of the same, right? Like the SERP analysis results in this is what is going to rank, so I'm going to write more of it. Exactly. So Google's, um, they have a thing called EEAT, Experience, Expertise, Authoritativeness, and Trustworthiness. And it's part of their quality rater guidelines. Google has these people who actually review websites, rate them, quality raters who rate the websites according to various criteria. And a lot of that criteria is to assess whether or not the content is uh, reflecting uh, experience, expertise, authoritativeness, and trustworthiness. It was originally EAT, Expertise, Authoritativeness, and Trustworthiness. And they added the extra E for experience on, again, I'm terrible, I'm gonna say a year, two years ago. Somewhere in the last two years. They didn't pull the E for experience out of a hat. It's because they saw something. SEOs love to say that, oh, Google's looking at user behavior more than they, they are letting on. And that seems to have been true with some certain, uh, the leaks from the Department of Justice trial against Google. But that basically means that you're, you're basically admitting that Google is looking at what users are consuming and profiling that. And if Google can sense, we'll call it sense, but if Google can decipher that people are looking for, they're going to Reddit more often, they're going to Quora more often, they're stuck on this piece of content and the language profile seems to indicate that there's actual experience here, that they're going to try to the best of their ability to double down on showing experience. What they'll initially do is what they did do which is over rely on things like Reddit, Quora, and all the other social media platforms, which I think is a problem. What they want to do, and they've announced that they're going to do this, is that they want to reward more firsthand knowledge in the search results. And they say it could be from forums, but they also say it could be from blogs, shorthand content, all these kind of things. And what will inevitably happen is people will see, oh, you're ranking Reddit, you're ranking Quora, you've ruined the results, they don't make any sense now, there's too much Reddit. Right before there was no Reddit, now there's too much Reddit. <laughs> Without realizing, like, that's complicated to get that right. First off, does that content actually exist on blogs yet? Probably not, because the incentive cycle, which is very much based on Google, hasn't demanded that yet. 
now that we're all talking about firsthand knowledge, firsthand experience, we're going to slowly over the next number of years create actual content based on actual experience. And then Google will have that content to ring. So I think it's important to realize that getting it right is very hard. Google is going to screw this up for a long time, but inevitably, they're either going to figure it out or they're going to go out of business. And I put my money on Google figuring it out. One of the, I, I want to run this by you. I have had this hypothesis for a while. Haven't had a chance to test it out, but we want to test it out with our own website now that our domain rating's at a pretty competitive level. Um, and maybe y'all might want to test it at Wix or maybe you already have, but this idea that for a lot of SEOs or content marketers, the process of figuring out how to write something that ranks is analyze what's already ranking, do more of that, maybe do it a little bit better, a little bit different. And one of my hypotheses is what if a highly authoritative website, let's say Wix, or a HubSpot or, or an Adobe writes about that same topic. And instead of writing to the lowest common denominator, which tends to be like beginners or one-on-one folks, they write about it in a very advanced and nuanced way, like not what the existing search results show. And it still ranks on page one. Like how might that change the game theory or as you said, the incentives for the next person who analyzes those SERPs and says, wait, everything's one-on-one, but this one or two pages, very nuanced, not 101, has no what is or like why it's important headers, but ranking on, on page one. Like what does that ha- what, what does that do to the, the industry? I love that question, by the way. It's probably the best question I've heard in a long time. Um, first, if that ever happens, I will buy you a beer a day for the rest of your life. <laughs> I'll let you know how the test goes out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go to the surf every day and see what's happening Get that beer. <laughs> it would fundamentally change the game right? You would start, people would start to, oh, because the people do look and people do see what the big brands are doing, right? When uh, CNET and uh, Bankrate and Sports Illustrated produce AI content, everyone saw that real quick. So people do notice the, co- the content. I think the problem is it's a risk and big brands are risk adverse. So why, and this is where it's on Google, why would I take the risk for the sake of the internet if my job is on the line, and if I bet wrong or incorrectly on Google's ability, I'm in big trouble. But I know if I do this, there's nothing better anyway. I have a huge cache of authority. Why the hell not? So there is no incentive. And that's really on Google to figure that out. And Google keeps talking about this. We're going to rank the hidden gems of the web. That hasn't happened yet. All the ranking is about the crap from Reddit. I don't see it happening. <laughs> <laughs> but that's why they're talking about that. And I, I, I think that has been successful, at least in the conversations I've had with enterprise, not just at Wix, but other enterprise companies of at least, okay, like that's something we need to think about. We, need, we do need to up our level of content. We do need to think beyond the SERP. And we do need to, because Google's continuously talking about these sort of hidden gems. No, I don't think Google will ever do it but we're going to at least bring that up as part of the conversation. So that that part has happened, but the implementation hasn't happened yet because of what nothing's ranked, nothing's changed yet. But it would be fabulous if it did because it really is a problem. The copycat content and by the way, and you do have to be careful because again, there are these gaps. You you have to somehow balance. If I were to do this, I would very carefully balance hitting all of the points that Google is showing on the SERP. I've identified one, two, three, four, five points. Great, that is in my content. Now I feel safe to experiment doing some more novel things because I'm worried that the machine learning profiling on this topic says A, B, C, D, E, F, G, that's what this topic consists of. If I don't do that, even though those A, B, C, D, E, F, G are really stupid to include, but if I don't align, I'm in hot water. So I'm going to align, but I'm also at the same time going to be creative with it. That I would do that. And I think brands should be doing that. I don't think they are. 100%. I love that. Yeah, it, it's that additional effort. It's like, how do we know it'll pay off if you put in that extra 20, 30% of, of time and resources into, into that article? Yeah, I mean, that's the whole thing. Oh, Google's not ranking it. Well, if it had other stuff, do you think it, it might? Especially if you have the authority to do it. 
go for it. They're going to rank you first off. You know, like one of these big websites, Google Ricky anyway, come on. <laughs> I just say that tongue in cheek, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> so our, our conversation reminds me of this article I read around, maybe you might've seen it was around like the AI dark forest. It, are you familiar with that piece? Um, no. And then I'm familiar with the concept, right? That uh, you don't want to be the one who all of a sudden like stands out and gets you know, caught with your pants down kind of thing. Yeah, the, the dark forest theory is, I think it comes from like, maybe it's science fiction or actual like science, but... It's science fiction, yeah. Yeah, where maybe for listeners here, because it sounds like you already know, we don't know if we're the only universe that exists. The game theory is, why would we let, if there is another life form out there, universe that can travel between universes or galaxies, um, why would we let them know we exist? Because what if they have malintent and would want to hurt us? Because they're scared of us as well. So like when you apply it to the AI world or like an internet with a lot of AI content, how do you signal that you're a human on the internet? And like, would you want to signal that, I suppose? I, I think yes. And I, I, I'm, this is not really an SEO question per se. I think it's really a branding question. I love brand marketing. I think if you're a brand, now is the time to take that risk. I think, look, marketers need to take risks. And if you're not going to put yourself out there, you're just not going to be able to do anything uh, really creative and really that like, sticks and, and really to differentiate yourself and to really be a, I don't know, a player or a baller or whatever you want to call it. But if you have your finger on the pulse, you realize like sentiment is changing. I think the, the fundamental underpinnings of web content have completely changed. I think it's why you see Google basically grasping at straws right now. If I'm a brand marketer and I, I, I see that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shoot my shot. If I see that content getting more conversational, I'm going to be that one brand that doesn't use those marketing cliches anymore, that doesn't use the marketing language anymore, that just talks to the consumer, eye level. And I'm, I'm not even trying to sell you something. I'm just trying to inform you with a tinge of, please buy my thing so I can feed my family. I would be that brand marketer. I would get ahead of the curve. You always want to be the first one there, but you can't be the first one there until you take that risk. And if you're the first one yet there, you, for years, you position yourself to be ahead of the game for years. I mean, look at like all the big brands. They were the first, Ford was the first one there. That's probably a bad example. Coke, Coke is the first one there. Pepsi's trying to play catch up. It's still trying to play catch up. You, you mentioned something in passing just now. You mentioned um, Google is grasping at straws. Oh boy. But what did you mean by that? <laughs> there is a lot of chatter that Google is broken. Um, I saw a study come out. I didn't read it yet. It's on my tab I, right here. To, that goes through, I supposedly goes through and analyzes that the results are just not as good as they were before. And you could see it yourself. I, I had this, I had it today. I was looking, I was, it was my baking soda thing. And I was looking for something and I got a lot of forums. I'm like, oh, this is not what I want. 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 This is, and it took a long time to, I got to a wire cutter article and I like the wire cutter. They do a great job. Like why, why did it take me two scrolls a lot of effort for my thumb. I do a lot of thumbing. Getting a thumb workout. <laughs> yeah, come on. I don't want to scroll. I have to scroll two folds to get to something? Screw that, Google. I'm not doing that. Why? Why is it these random ass Reddit? Google is broken. There's been multiple algorithm updates, official algorithm updates. There was a official update in August, another one in September, another two in October, and another one in November. It's been bonkers. And since then, you can see on the, there's, there's these uh, tools like the SEMrush weather, uh, the SEMrush sensor tracks rank fluctuations. Are they normal or are they above normal? And you can see every week another spike, the next week another spike, another spike. And to me, Google realizes that it's broken. Everyone, I think, realizes something's not right. And Google's trying to recalibrate. Okay, let's get the machine learning to recalibrate. What do we think? Do we fix it yet? Not yet. We're almost there. Let's try it again next week. I'm oversimplifying this. But Google's trying to get it right because I think it reminds me of COVID. When COVID hit, things like what to do with my kids took on an entirely different meaning and intent. Things that Google thought it understood, it no longer understood. And it took it a long time to figure it out. Rankings were bonkers. So you look at the charts, like this website flew up and that one flew down and this one's flying up the next day because it's trying to figure it out. And this kind of reminds me of that, but not as not as concentrated, not as chaotic as, but I think Google's looking at user behavior. It obviously is, it's making, it's made numerous announcements about experience of firsthand content that indicate they are focused on user behavior. You see them with things uh, announcing like Gemini. When they announced Gemini, 
part of that is a, a reformatting of the results that Gemini gives out. So it's not on the result page, but in Gemini's results, if I search for a recipe or if I search for something else, I'll get an entirely different format that lets me explore it differently. Google even announced now, like they have like a thing you can now, if you circle the image, it now pulls up, a, it now pops up a new search thing. And you can search just off the image that way. It realizes patterns have changed. Google realized user behavior patterns have changed. Because it relies so heavily on user behavior, it's doing the equivalent of freaking out and trying to figure out how do we, how do we, how do we nail this? And it's going to take them a long time. But right now, things are not broken. I mean, it's hyperbolic, but things, something's not right. Let's put it that way. It's interesting to hear that from you. And then you consider that there's, there's BARD, there's SGE, there's Google Assistant, which I haven't kind of... Oh, no, that's going to be gone. They fired half the team there. So uh, I, guess, I guess we could finally put voice search in its grave. Great. Yes. <laughs> it's never worked out for me very much, very well. So this question just came up as you were talking about that. If, if Google is broken, what does that mean for SEOs? It's a big problem. I mean, look, does it mean, that, by the way, it doesn't mean that every case and every scenario and every website you're going to face these issues, right? So you could be, you're fine. It could be that you've seen mild fluctuation and mild changes. It means being, it means understanding what's happening in the ecosystem, having your finger on the pulse to realize, okay, like, maybe I shouldn't go and start like fixing my entire website. Maybe if I go and I go to Google and I look at the keyword that I used to rank for, now I see Reddit, 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 Reddit. Okay, this is one of those keywords, like something that's just like not right. And I was, I, on our, our podcast, it surfs up, we did like a 2024 prediction show. I know that's really cliche. We just, how do you not do one? So we did one. But um, there's an SEO named Rohan Iyer from out of India. And his prediction was, sit around for six months and wait for the dust to settle. And I'm not saying you should like, you know, like sit on your hands and just do nothing. But yeah, you, SEOs kind of need to weather it out and see where the dust kind of settles. Because what are you going to do? Make a change and the next day Google makes a change and then you're making the change again? Does it, does it even work that way? I, you know, I, I know, I don't know if Wayne Gretzky actually said this. I think there's a debate about this. <laughs> you know what I'm going to say. And it's like super cliche, but you, you skate towards the puck. If I were to play hockey, I would skate towards the smallest person and body check them. Uh-huh. But Wayne would skate towards the puck. <laughs> that is good advice. Like, again, if you think that Google's not going to figure it out, then you're in full panic mode. How are we going to do what we're going to do? If you are confident that long term Google's going to figure it out, then you would kind of do just kind of skate towards the puck. But that the real problem comes if you have a real traffic loss. And now what do you do? And I don't have a great answer for that without having the case in front of me. But that that's a real problem. Because if the if the thing is broken, like what what, what exactly do you do? Yeah, and if, if there's a traffic loss, there's probably more at play than just whatever Google might be doing. There's probably other things that you can actually, that are in your control, right? There's, yeah, there could be a lot of other things. I'm saying, so yeah, usually there's something there. But if you see that, no, Google's like, there, there's been all sorts of cases where Google's just not getting this right. That's a real problem, especially if it hits your revenue. And that's, a, that's why, to their credit, that is why SEOs complaining is a big deal and a good thing because it does put pressure. It does create conversations like we're having now and it does create a little bit of pressure at Google. They, they know what we're saying. They see it. And that's a healthy thing because it puts a little pressure on them to figure it out because it does really impact businesses and it can. So let's, um, as my coach likes to say, like, he says he's not a therapist. He's like, therapy is about like asking why things are a certain way and com- maybe complaining about it. Coaching is about what are we going to do about it? And one of the articles you wrote on um, advancedwebranking.com, you, you talked about why you believe Google's SGE and AI will mean more revenue opportunity for SEO agencies. And I'll even expand that to just career opportunities for smart SEOs in general. Right. Yeah. Maybe we get before we get into that discussion. Maybe you can give a, a high level overview for listeners who might not be familiar with it. Why? Why do you believe that? Yeah. So, Advanced Web Ranking asked me to write a piece about um, agencies and the future of agencies in a uh, AI world, a- SEO agencies. I think, but I think it applies kind of across the board. I've had a very similar question for many, many years at Wix. I don't know if I'm allowed to spill the beans, but I spilled the beans in the article, and no one said anything. So, whatever. Wix was at one time very worried that SEOs are not going to adopt. We made all these changes. They're not going to adopt us because we're not WordPress. So I can't charge for the hosting. 
I can't charge for installing a plugin. I can't charge for removing the plugin once it breaks your website. I can't charge again for reinstalling a different plugin and then uninstalling it once it breaks your website again. That nickel and diming effect, SEOs are not going to be able to charge for. What do we do? And I'm like, nah, you're good. Because those aren't the SEOs that you want anyway. SEOs who care about their clients would rather take that $5,000 a month retainer, write a couple of blog articles, uh, do some optimization, maybe get some links, you know, that's your thing, rather than spend that money fixing a broken plugin. So SEOs who care about the client's satisfaction and the client's long-term growth, this is a good thing. Now you can tell agencies, hey, you can come to Wix with your client and you can say, hey, client, we're going to take all of your money and we're not going to put any of it to maintenance and we're not going to put any of it to broken things and we're not going to put any of it to any of that stuff. We're going to put all of it to PPC, to SEO, to, to growth marketing, to whatever it is. Better for you. And it's the same thing with AI. Oh, AI. Oh, I, I won't be able to, uh, to SEO anymore. Or I won't be able to be a, a content writer anymore. If your job was writing descriptions about socks, that might be true. And I'm not putting down like that. Someone needed to do it. Someone needed to write about the product description for socks. So yeah, that's a problem. Someone working at Bombus is like, why is, why is, what does Morty have against me? <laughs> the person working at like Haynes is like, oh, man, that guy's a jerk. But if you're an SEO or a content marketer or a content writer or whatever it is that you're doing and you're, you're getting paid for your brain, this is a great thing for you because your brain is needed more than ever. Things are changing more than ever. I know that sounds you know, cliche. Cli the ecosystem is just fundamentally different. Client expectations are different. Clients are confused. Like you, we used it before. Your clients are like, hey, they came to you. They thought X. They relied on your very smart brain to tell them, no, 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 don't do that. That's an exact case of what I'm trying to say. Like You are a case of AI is good for me because now I can advise clients not to do stupid things about AI. In fact, I can make my whole business Come learn about what not to do with AI before you tank your entire business. But that's basically the gist of it. If you can use your brain, if you are using your brain, you're in a better position because your brain is more needed because you need to navigate all of this changing content expectations, user expectations, AI capabilities, all that kind of stuff. Those conversations are not easy. Let's just say that. And I understand why some folks kind of cave in and they say, hey, the client wants this. I'm going to do it. They're going to pay me. And then they kind of dig themselves right. into a hole. And we had to say, we won't do it for you, but we, if you would like to do that, like you can go to another agency to do that. And it, it hurts. That's big though. I, mean, that's a, I feel that's such a healthy thing. I know it's hard, obviously. And I'm not judging anybody, by the way, who doesn't, because look, you have to put food on the table and, you, I, I, and there's no judgment here. Yep, exactly. But that positions you to really differentiate yourself from, let's say, other marketers or other agencies. And I think that that's going to become a bigger and bigger, bigger thing. How do I differentiate myself? How do I find that angle? How do I find that niche? Look, even from an SEO point of view, a lot of the changes are going to happen to the, to the results page. And you were talking about SGE and blah, 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 blah. I think SGE's novelty is not a, um, a text output. I ask, uh, who SGE, who's the best baseball player? And tells, well, you know, uh, people say Babe Ruth is, but Jackie Robinson might be the best player because he really, and that's, that's a, like, a whole argument about that. And the SGE gives me all the information. Okay, great. Thank you, SGE, for setting the record straight that Babe Ruth is not actually the best baseball player because of the way the league was set up back then. I could get that though from a website. Like, I could. I just click on it and, and it theoretically tell me that. So like, is that really the novelty that uh, I, something wrote it custom for me? The AI loves me. It wrote me a custom message about Babe Ruth not being the best baseball player. I'm a Yankee fan, by the way. So don't get on me for Babe Ruth not being the best baseball player. I think SGE's uniqueness will be in how it facilitates that information. So it can offer me the, the, the summary. It could then offer me a whole bunch of videos of different people at ESPN talking about the same thing. It could offer me a bunch of podcasts about it. It could, it could give me the opportunity to really explore that. And it's what you see, as I mentioned before, in Google's Gemini, it has custom displayed results. If I'm looking for X, the display of the results is X, so that it allows me to explore that based on that type of content or that topic. SGE can do the same thing in theory, and I think that's where it's really novel. So the entire, ego, my point is, going back to what we were saying, the entire ecosystem is fundamentally changing and understanding things like that and understanding that it's going to get harder 
Because if Google does something like that and it does allow for these custom kind of pathways, the days of casting a wide net and trying to pull in tons of traffic are over. People are going to look for very specific things at very specific moments in very specific formats on, in very specific topical journeys. And you're going to have to be able to, to target your users in that way. And that's where having that big brain comes in because it used to be, the web used to be kind of simple-ish. We'll, we'll write a post. It'll be a, for a head term. We'll get a lot of traffic. We'll pull them in. And then we'll throw links or uh, CTAs to the thing that we want them to actually click on. But if that's not going to be the case, and it's increasingly not the case, and you have to target a topic and target a particular part of the or subtopic or a particular uh, a medium or channel or, or, or content format, that's way more complicated. That's very strategic. Yeah, what, what I like to say to a lot of folks who are kind of other professionals in the, this sort of industry is, with great uncertainty comes great opportunity. Don't be scared trying to find a way to take advantage of it while, while people are looking for People are looking for certainty. If you can at least find a smart way to approach these problems, like this, this should be f- fun, not scary. Yeah, it should be fun. But do you think people are going to be bold enough to do that? Not everyone, but if if one or two people hear the right message and they go, they go for it. I'm I'm happy. That's, I I'll take it. <laughs> so I, I know we're coming up on time here. So I, I have one personal question, and we'll we'll close out with a couple closing questions as well. But you'd mentioned before our conversation, you have four boys under 12. Yes. You ha- you're on all these podcasts and doing all, all this stuff as like doing SEO brand for Wix. What's your time or energy management system? Oh if gosh. any, like you can say, you're kind of just <laughs> figuring it out about a minute, but it's always impressive. People ask me, oh, can you send me a calendar link? But I don't, I don't have a calendar link. Like my schedule is not like that. Like it's, it's constantly in flux. I don't have a, here's a free slot kind of thing. <laughs> um, it's hard. Like I specifically like block time out of my calendar, like don't even try to book a meeting with me. It's just time for the kids. And I try to like, you know, spend those even just 10, 15 minutes with each kid just to give them that personal attention kind of thing. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't work. I feel very guilty about it when it doesn't work. But it's really, it's, it's a conscious effort to try to do it. And I do say no now. I think that's okay. That's the thing. Like saying no is okay sometimes. Or, you know, not taking things on. I used to run a thing called SEO chat, which I kind of stopped doing as a Twitter chat. And it was, it would interfere like Thursday night with my, it's, it's not worth it. I'm going, and I always felt bad because it was a community asset. I had to go from somebody else that somebody else to go from somebody else. But at a certain point, I, I just can't. And that, that, that's okay. Saying no is okay. I'm saying that to myself as I say it to the audience. Yeah. I, I appreciate you saying yes to this conversation. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you for having me, by the way. Of course. So let, let's close it out uh, with a couple um, closing questions and then we'll wrap up from here. So what is one opinion you have about business? You, we've already shared a lot of hot takes, but what's another opinion you might have about business you think people would disagree with? This is such a hot take. I'm getting so much trouble for this. Not in trouble, I'm in trouble with. Um, brand is one million times more important than acquisition. In fact, ignore acquisition for to a certain extent and focus on your brand because the acquisition will come with that and the doors will open up. You're looking at me like I'm nuts. Uh, I, I strongly disagree, but that is not, it is not the place to disagree. So we should, we should have you on for a part two. <laughs> no, you disagree. I'm cool with that. That's my opinion. That's you know, to quote the Big Lebowski. That's just your opinion, man. Like, I get it. That's my opinion. I'm not saying, by the way, don't focus on acquisition. That's not like I'm being a little hyperbolic. No, I fully understand. I, um, I'm more of the, the nuance take where it's like, it's not mutually exclusive. But hey, if we take two extremes, it makes for a fun debate. <laughs> so what is one impactful piece of advice you've been given? Um, it's my grandmother, and she told me, don't be a schmuck. It's good advice. I think that was good advice. Yeah, it's pretty simple. I don't think she meant it in a nice way, but it was good advice still. <laughs> seems like it worked out for you. Yeah, it seems like it, for the most part. Awesome. What's one book you'd recommend more people read? Ah, okay, this is like a, this is like a deep cut. So I used to be a teacher. Uh, I did Teach for America. I taught in Baltimore's inner city. And I read a book. It, the basic concept is he was a teacher in a classroom. And what he would do is a kid would, imagine you're a teacher and you ask the kids to draw a butterfly. And what you would normally do, okay, everyone submits their paper. You take the butterfly and you tell them, well, that's wrong and that's wrong and that's wrong and that's wrong. But what he does is, okay, let's have a conversation about the butterfly. Let's compare like this picture and that picture what do you notice? Well, my butterfly, the wings could be a little bit more rounded. Oh, okay. Why don't you go back and let's let's do that? And then you finally get there and going and going and going because it's all a process. 
And by the end of it, the kid draws the butterfly and it matches the actual picture because you've really like walked them through and scaffold them through that and to just like say that's wrong and that's wrong. So this guy's name is Ron Berger and he has a book called An Ethic of Excellence. And it goes through his whole, his whole process of classroom management and all these kind of things. But it really applies to everything in life. Like, look, as a content person, a lot of people feel like I have to write the content and I have to get it right the first time. But that's, sometimes it happens. If you get good at content, it happens pretty often. But sometimes you get something that's a little bit different than what you're used to doing. Like I was just writing a thing. They asked me to write, you know, four pages on whatever. I'm like, four pages, okay. It ended up being 10. But that's fine. Like, okay, now let's go back. Let's say, okay, what do we take out? What do we add in? Maybe it should be different. So it's fine to take these things and create and make them a process versus it is either good or it is either, either bad. It's not good or it's, it's not bad. It's, it's on the spectrum of evolution towards being. That's very existential. Oh, whoa, where, where are we going with this? <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I love that. It's just, it's all iterative. You know, yeah. it's, not a, it's not one and done, ideally. No, not at all. And that's great for, like, for your team also. Like people come to your team like, hey, that's great. Let's take a look at it. Let's go back. Let's rework it. Let's, you know, as opposed to, no, that was bad. That's not good for your team. That's bad for your team. Yeah, I agree. All right, last question here. Where can people find you on the internet? I still call it Twitter and I refuse to call it X because it's just a stupid name. Um, I'm on Twitter a lot at Morty Oberstein and I'm on LinkedIn. I have a Mastodon account, but I don't really use it and I hate Facebook. Likewise. <laughs> so we'll make sure to include links to, to all of your profiles. Morty, it was a, a pleasure to have you on the show. I appreciate you saying yes and making the time and looking forward to chatting again soon. Thanks for having me.